hear you. I hear you. Well, if you're ready to uh, head down the home stretch, I'm going to step aside because as we continue our final hour of the America's Future Series, uh, David, the founder, David Hamilton, the founder and the CEO, the chairman of uh, America's Future Series, is going to take us home. You've got a little uh, interview you're going to share, and our good friends from NASA, I guess, next up, right? Absolutely. I have a, a distinct honor All right. of being able to visit with, with the colonel. You get to play moderator for yeah, a that's little right. bit. So I'll, I'll step aside. Take it away. Thank you. Good afternoon, Colonel Melroy. How are you today, Pamela? I'm doing very well. Thank you. It's great to be here as a part of the summit. Oh, well, it's great to have you here. And like I like to say, you always win the prize for the best backdrop. You always have the best <laughs> backdrop there. First off, with the NASA logo, you can't, you can't beat that. And then, of course, the imagery is fantastic. And, you know, we wanted to have you speak for quite some time. You're kind of a tough kid. It's, and we, we joked the other day, it's because you've kind of been a little bit busy, right? Got had a couple things going on recently in the past couple of years. So it's great to have you here. I'd love for you to share those sorts of things with us, um, and especially what's going on right now. Particularly interested in all these uh, discussions about going to the moon, why we're going to the moon, and all that kind of stuff. So but I thought I'd open the floor uh, with you and say, hey, um, if you would, you know, share a little, little bit like, uh, like why are we going to back, to back to the moon? Why should we care? Those sort of things, and, and maybe, maybe what some of the plans are with regard to that. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, that's really interesting looking at the range of topics being discussed here. Uh, so many things that we have to think about every day at NASA that are impacting us. In so many ways, I really believe that space is at a turning point um, in both advanced capabilities, but also commercial capabilities. And so this is a really great time to um, have a future series and think about the future because um, I think we need to focus on it so that we can make sure that we're gonna create the future we want. Mm -hmm. So I'll talk a little bit about advanced technology capabilities first. NASA is on the cusp of an amazing number of milestones in human space flight, technology, aeronautics, and science. And we're really in a new era of exploration, which is characterized by transform transformational things like the James Webb Space Telescope and a return to the moon. And as uh, you may know, the first images taken by the Webb Telescope were revealed today, mm -hmm. and they are amazing. From the deepest images of our universe ever taken to the atmosphere of a planet orbiting another star. We've really just barely begun to tap the many ways that Webb is going to rewrite textbooks and change our understanding of the cosmos and ideally the physics of the cosmos as well. In the next couple of months, we're gonna be launching Artemis One, which will be our uncrewed test of the largest and most powerful rocket ever built with the only spacecraft rated for humans to travel to deep space. It's going to go much farther than any spacecraft ever has. And it's the first of our missions that will bring humans back to our neighbor to orbit in 2024 and land the first woman on the moon in the 2025 timeframe. That's fantastic. Also today, Time Magazine announced the International Space Station is one of the world's 50 greatest places. And having visited three times, I completely agree. I really wish everyone on the planet could have that view of it from above. It would really change uh, things down here if everyone could see how fragile and amazing our planet is when you can see it as an interconnected system. I always like to say we're all the crew of Spaceship Earth and at NASA, we're working to understand our planet in an array of ways so we can learn how it's changing and become better stewards. We've been encouraging commercial capabilities for cargo, but also for taking our astronauts to the ISS. And we've seen enormous progress in that area. Commercial human spaceflight is very important because those opportunities not only open up a perspective to more people, particularly as the price eventually will come down, but it has the potential to lead to a completely new form of transportation. So we're still a ways from commercial point to point transportation via space, but the suborbital and orbital commercial human space businesses are absolutely helping advance those capabilities. And of course, it's not just transportation. Every day our industry partners are developing and growing capabilities to support an economy in low earth orbit that continues to expand and evolve. We're very excited about the extension of ISS to 2030 so that we can continue to advance science and prepare for humans in deep space. But we're also excited about the four companies we're working with on commercial LEO destinations. These destinations will be a follow-on to the ISS 
to allow us to continue to do microgravity research and focus our resources on advanced capabilities going out into the solar system. And of course, the potential does exist for opportunities to bring economic activity to the moon with us. They're starting to develop quickly. Industry is going to be back at the moon helping us to prepare to send astronauts there as our partners begin the first commercial lunar payload service deliveries later this year to bring science and technology payloads to the moon for NASA and for other customers. And of course, our international partners are also very eager to join us on our return to the moon and work with us to take what we learn there and apply it towards human missions to Mars. So let me unpack that piece a little bit. We pretty much have the first few missions planned and the hardware and development, but what we're focusing on now is the long-term. What does exploration look like in 20 years? Mm -hmm. What we're trying to do is develop a blueprint for sustained human presence and exploration throughout the solar system. So we're starting that by developing and documenting an objectives-based approach for NASA's Moon to Mars strategy. So leaders from each of our mission directorates have worked over the last several months to develop a draft set of objectives that we believe define what we must do in our Moon to Mars strategy to support developing that long-term blueprint. So the idea is we're gonna practice on the moon to prepare to demonstrate this blueprint on Mars and eventually other destinations. We started actually from first principles, which is the why. When we talk about why we send humans to space, I've always heard three different fundamental reasons. Not everyone agrees with all of them and some think is one is more important than others, but they all carry weight and our most successful programs orchestrate all three of these pillars. And those pillars are science, inspirational, and national posture. It's important to recognize that science is one of the major foundations of why we send humans to space. And I assure you that astronauts get that and are very proud of it. So we set out 50 objectives across four, area, 50, four areas and we've asked for feedback from both the commercial and the international community. And we're going through a series of workshops now to discuss it. So let me talk about the four areas or buckets. And the big headings are transportation and habitation, lunar and Martian infrastructure, and science uh, and operations. And so that covers a lot of territory, but we really want to be comprehensive. We're going for both practical, but also aspirational. As I mentioned, science is one of the major reasons that we're going. So we want to make sure that we're doing transformational science and also that we understand how best to use humans to do science. NASA is pretty good at doing remote science right now. Witness our experiences on Mars with the Perseverance rover. We're about to hit 25 years of having rovers on Mars. We really know how to do that. Now we need to figure out how to bring humans in and be efficient with human machine teaming. So as far as operations, NASA will advance through the Artemis program, the capability to live and work on another world. So Artemis one is getting very close. Uh, we're hoping to launch by the end of August. There's still a lot of questions for the uh, later missions. And in particular, I wanna mention uh, infrastructure. One of the reasons why infrastructure is important is as we go deeper into the solar system, we are going to find longer and longer journey times. The moon is only three days away, but Mars at best right now is six months. Even with advanced technologies, it will still be several months journey. And as we go and push out beyond that, we're gonna find even longer and longer visits. So if one of the things we learned from the space shuttle was doing science uh, for about 10 days at a time, six, day, six times a year was not enough. And that's why we built the International Space Station so we could maximize the science return by doing science 24 seven. We're gonna have that same problem when we go out into the solar system. We're going a long way away. We really need to be able to have humans sustain their presence so that they can maximize their science return. And that's why we're focused on demonstrating and developing infrastructure. And those technologies are gonna be incredibly important. 
this infrastructure should also be scalable because it's not just potentially for NASA, it's also for our commercial partners. And what I mean by infrastructure are the backbone for living and working on another planet, communications, position navigation and timing, power, in situ resource utilization, prepared landing areas, and other things. So just as NASA has done with commercial crew and cargo, one thing we're thinking about here is not just the business case for transportation, which is already proven, but also for these other infrastructure areas. And we wanna partner with industry on that. We wanna create an environment where that innovation and partnership can advance what's possible. And throughout the exploration, we recognize how little law there is other than the Outer Space Treaty of 1967, which is essentially principles that have been enacted into each nation's legal framework. Space community is recognizing we need norms of behavior in Earth orbit to help advance our economies, build capabilities, but also to manage global concerns like the growth of orbital debris. Going out into the solar system is just gonna make these norms of behavior even more important. I like to say how we go is just as important as what we're doing. And NASA, through the Artemis Accords, is helping to build a roadmap for all nations to join us in this effort and establish those guidelines, which we hope will become norms by which we'll all peacefully explore together. So as an explorer myself, I couldn't be more excited about what's, what's coming. NASA's newest mission statement succinctly encapsulates the broadest statement about what we're doing here. NASA explores the unknown in air and space, innovates for the benefit of humanity, and inspires the world through discovery. And all of that ties into so many of the things that have been discussed here at the summit, from the space economy, to new ways the government is partnering with industry and other nations, to new technologies, and the new ways we have to learn to do things. Uh, I look forward to our conversation and to more dialogues like this going on at the summit as we focus our eyes on the future and drive the changes that we need for the future we want, which is to bring the best of humanity into space. Thank you. Well, thank you. Um, you know, I think it's really important to have a futurist, you know, think about the future and what's the foundation that has to be laid uh, mm -hmm. for us to be able to coexist and to partner and to um, explore uh, like space, as you said, peacefully. So these Ar Artemis Accords um, are sort of, uh, well, I think will be a legacy. Those people, you got, uh, people who are doing this, laying this foundation about how we will co cooperate, the rules of engagement. It's kind of like yeah. early maritime law, right? Oh, yeah. It's very, the very analogous model. And so it, I guess you have to be proud and pretty excited to be part of something that will be a legacy. I mean, maybe in the days of Star Trek, will people refer back to the Artemis Accords, et cetera, right? And, and how that laid a foundation. So um, that's very exciting. And uh, it's also very exciting to see, you know, you know every time we're, we, we try to solve some big problem, some very challenging technical problem, et cetera, we've learned from that, right? Mm -hmm. And you're pushing the envelope about being able to put people on Mars and, and, and that kind of stuff. You know, that's, that's sort of the ultimate challenge. I mean, failure is not an option, right? So, right even though it may, it does happen from time to time, but we, uh, we try to learn from that. But um, doing that sort of thing at that edge is where we learn. And you're taking on the big challenges. And so I think that's really exciting. And I don't think people understand, maybe you could speak to it a little bit, when we try to um, push and go to something we've never done before, that's really hard, we learn a lot from that. Right? And, and there's so many technological advances that we enjoy now that we wouldn't have if it wasn't for NASA and the space race and all this sort of stuff. So if you could talk a little bit about the future and maybe what some of the technological requirements are going to be for us to be able to go into space, if you'd like to share a little bit of your thoughts on that, that would be wonderful. Sure. Yeah, it's uh, yeah, the technology is fascinating. And really, uh, you know, what I found uh, through my career is these uh, big aspirational ideas often come down to a handful of technologies that simply need to be matured uh, in order to you know, create the capability. Uh, and then when you can mature each of them, it almost seems like a miracle when you can pull it all together. So I, I look at, um, for example, the uh, International Space Station was a tremendous capability. I mean, we were really nervous when we started. We, we knew that we were gonna have to do more spacewalks than had ever occurred in the entire history of the human spaceflight program. 
in the first two or three years of assembling mm -hmm. the space station. Um, in addition to that, we really needed the advanced robotics uh, that allowed us to assemble the station. And we also had to have our spacewalkers have tools and capabilities to do the fine dexterous work. Well, so many of those technologies, oh, and by the way, the rendezvous and proximity operations that we had to practice every single time are now paying off in things like uh, satellite servicing, right? The ability to do it autonomously, you don't have to have an astronaut but we matured in all of those capabilities, which has led to this capability now of satellite servicing. So as I look out ahead, uh, I see the big technical challenges, um, clearly sustaining people in a, a very hostile environment. It, it actually has a lot of uh, capacity to transfer here on earth. In particular, for example, the work that we're doing on the International Space Station to try to get to a closed loop life support system. You just can't assume that you're gonna be launching water and supplies uh, and air and things like that the way we can to the space station. So we're really trying to get to a fully closed loop life support system. And a key part of that is the water reclamation technologies that we've made enormous progress on that have transferred uh, to places that can benefit from that here on Earth. Mm -hmm. We also need to protect our astronauts from radiation. And uh, that's uh, actually something that does have a direct uh, impact here on Earth as well. When you consider so many of the medical procedures that we do, that we worry about uh, exposure to radiation, we can, uh, we can create capabilities that will help us in that area. One of the things that I'm very excited about too is nuclear technologies, nuclear surface power uh, using fission technologies, nuclear electric and nuclear thermal propulsion. Uh, we really need to advance these propulsion uh, technologies so that we can get humans out into the solar system faster, right? The less time that they're exposed to the radiation and the microgravity environment, the better off uh, and, and the healthier our astronauts will be, particularly when they have to land unsupported on the surface of another planet after months in microgravity. So those are some of the, the big technical areas. Uh, and I, I, I should also mention um, a big focus area for us is in situ resource utilization. Now, we, we don't know very much about extracting um, capabilities. We want to get find water throughout the solar system because it works as um, rocket fuel. So every kilogram that you don't have to take from earth is useful for humans. So those are, I'm, I'm going to stop there because I could talk about technology forever, but I try to hit the high ones. Well, those are all fantastic. And of course, when you think about it, all of them can translate to some sort of benefit, as you mentioned here on earth, if we can mm -hmm. get better at small nuclear uh, generators, uh, uh, reactors, et cetera, power, et cetera, um, that are more reliable, safer, et cetera, we can generate energy better here on Earth, et cetera. As an example, everything we learn about the human body when it's under these stressors, et cetera, is something yeah. that we advance uh, our, our understanding of the human body and, and health, et cetera. The radiation uh, uh, problem that we deal with, right? That, 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 that's absolutely yeah. critical. Um, the challenges of solar um, radiation and uh, in, interrupting our um, ability to communicate and hardening those, et cetera, right? Um, every one of those has some sort of practical application and I remember growing up when people, and I was young when, the, uh, when we went to the moon, people said, why are we spending all this money going there? And then you had to build this ROI case. And look at all the things that we have now that we wouldn't have had if we hadn't made this effort, this, had, had made this investment. So we, we had maybe another five minutes or so, et cetera. But um, if you wouldn't mind talking a little bit about that and um, you know, the benefits that we've been, we, get, we expect to see out of it, we don't know what we don't know, right? So we have no clue how much benefit we're gonna get here on earth, et cetera, right? And, um, and so the, and, and that comes from a partnership more, and you guys are doing more and more of this partnership between the government and commercial, um, the mm -hmm. commercial sector, which is our strength. It's our innovative strength. If you could talk a little bit about that and the sort of the, the benefit, the selfish benefit that we get out of here on earth from all of the exploration and all of the problem solving that you guys do in space, that would be very interesting. Yeah, of course. I mean, I, I do go back to what I call those three pillars of why. Um, and uh, again, you know, people um, focus on different pillars, but I'm focused on all three because um, I think, you know, our job at NASA is uh, to provide benefit to the American taxpayer. 
And so these are the ways that we think we benefit, um, not just our, our citizens, um, but in addition to that, all of humanity. So I'll start for a moment with science and uh, understanding um, the science benefits uh, that we get from learning about the solar system, learning uh, about the cosmos. I mean, we really are very excited about the James Webb Telescope and what we're going to learn because we're going to look back in time to shortly after the Big Bang. And we know that the heavy elements that make up human beings and everything that we know, the carbon forms and other heavy molecules, were all formed in stars and galaxies. And so really figuring out how stars and galaxies formed is really the story of humanity in so many ways. And of course, uh, you know, I'll mention the fact that from space, we have the opportunity to look at our changing climate, um, to observe the earth and gather the data that we need to understand what is happening to the earth system. So uh, those, that science element is incredibly important. Um, inspiration, I think it goes without saying. We, we know that um, uh, one of the most successful times in our period to get a huge surge of, of students interested in STEM was at the, around the beginning of NASA and uh, the Apollo program uh, led to a huge number of uh, students, myself included, being inspired to study math, science, and engineering to want to be scientists, engineers, and astronauts. And we're really hoping that the Artemis program will have that same global impact on the next generation, the Artemis generation. And then I'll, I'll unpack national posture for a few minutes. That's incredibly important. Our investments in our science and technology capability have direct benefits for the citizens of our country. But more importantly, they have economic benefits as well. And there's also a very strong soft power aspect of what we do. NASA collaborates around the world. They are a partner of choice to do science, to do human exploration together. All of those things add up to national posture and national capability. And so all, all three of those areas, uh, I think, are, are things that I think about how we directly benefit uh, life here on Earth. Yeah. Well, you know, um, the inspirational part, uh, I think, is really important because I think people miss on that they, they don't value how short supply we are in STEM educated workers mm -hmm. and, and that knowledge base is missing everything else is popularized right we all want to be a kardashian we don't want to be a, an, a, an astronaut no we want people to aspire to be in space and have these and inspiring the youth of of today to be a scientist etc of tomorrow is a fundamental impact on our economy we need mm -hmm. those people i don't know how many more TikTok people we need i think we've got enough of those we need more people like you so uh, I really appreciate the inspirational aspect of it and the aspirational aspect of it. And, you know, and I was involved uh, tangentially in, in something called the Big Rip Theory. Um, and so uh, the James Webb uh, 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 Telescope is fascinating to me. You know, we may find out much more about the origins of the universe and therefore perhaps the potential ends of the universe, et cetera. And I don't know what that's worth. I don't know how that, uh, th what kind of ROI that is. But I think it's something intrinsic in the human spirit. We want to know where we came from and where we're going, and how it all ends. And, um, and, and, and that's, that's food for the soul, if you will. So um, you're, you're, you guys are doing things that are important on a practical basis and then also something that, uh, that, that fulfills us as human beings. And I just want to say thank you for all the work you're doing and your leadership at NASA. Thank you. Yeah, you're right. So much of what we do actually fills more than one of those pillars, right? The inspiration and science, the, the national posture is tied to STEM uh, education as well. They're all linked together. Awesome. And uh, I think about Webb and I, you know, think about the work that we do studying other planets, looking at Mars, which is a dry and barren planet, but once had water and possibly life. And uh, Webb being able to look at exoplanets uh, around, um, ar around our galaxy. I think understanding other planets may help us understand our own planet better too. The system comes out and Proxima B, you guys are going to tell us whether we can live there or not, right? That's right. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. Well, thank you so much for your time. It's, it's been wonderful having you here. We can't uh, thank you enough. And we look forward, hopefully, to your um, joining us again. And we look forward to hearing about your, your upcoming uh, your launches and, 
and uh, exploits in space. We we really looking forward to that. Thank you so much. Thank you, you ma'am.